to uh, turn it over to uh, Sandy for some opening remarks. Uh, thanks, everybody. I thought I'd make uh, just a few opening remarks to hit some of the uh, topics I know you're going to want to uh, <coughs> um, talk about. Uh, <coughs> first of all, the season, um, which ends next week, isn't completed yet. Um, obviously disappointing. Uh, didn't make the playoffs. Um, we're not over 500. Uh, on the other hand, I think there were some high points. Uh, <coughs> we were in first place for 100 days. I understand that the uh, division wasn't as strong as uh, some others, uh, but there was some exciting baseball that was played during that period of time. And our reliance on our bench and so forth, I think was, um, <clears throat> was interesting and exciting to our fans. Uh, obviously that period of time didn't extend beyond um, <clears throat> late July. And um, you know we haven't played well really since uh, the All-Star break. Probably a lot of reasons for that, um, <clears throat> you know. And uh, I don't need to get into those at this time. We can talk about them uh, during the Q&A. But uh, obviously, the last uh, really two months of the season have been uh, disappointing. Um, <clears throat> I know you want to talk about the manager and the coaching staff. Uh, <clears throat> You know, decisions on the manager and the coaches uh, will be made after the season. Uh, I hope as soon after the season as possible. Um, I always think that's the best practice. Um, <clears throat> we uh, will be, as you all know, hiring a head of baseball operations. And whether that managerial decision is made um, uh, after that individual is hired or before, it's difficult to say. But I would say, given the timing, that uh, probably that decision will be made uh, before we have somebody uh, as head of baseball operations. <coughs> uh, that process uh, will commence as soon as um, the end of the regular season, or certainly not later than the end of the postseason. Um, <coughs> we will be looking for uh, the president of baseball operations. Uh, as you all know, we uh, made a similar uh, search last year and uh, were not successful largely uh, because we were not able to get permission to talk to some of the individuals in whom we had uh, real interest. Uh, whether that circumstance continues this year or not is uh, <coughs> something we will certainly find out. But I do think that uh, industry um, uh, situations uh, change from year to year, individual situations change from year to year and we'll just have to see how that process goes. Um, <clears throat> lastly, uh, before we get into questions, just uh, talk about uh, the free agents that we have uh, uh, this season. Uh, we have two, uh, Syndergaard and Conforto, who uh, both uh, are subject to potential qualifying offers. Those are um, not made until uh, sometime after the World Series within five days or so of the end of the World Series. So those are decisions that will not be made immediately, but will be made uh, over the next several weeks. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, Michael Conforto has been uh, a stalwart for us over many years, uh, drafted by the Mets, and uh, had an immediate impact uh, during the, uh, um <clears throat> you know, mid-2015-16. Um, <clears throat> and uh, think very highly of Michael, and uh, that, that's a decision that we will uh, have to make. Um, obviously, Michael has not had the year that he would have liked, um, but uh, you know his career um, speaks for itself. It was nice to see Noah on the mound last night. It's been a long journey for him, um, roughly two years since he'd uh, pitched competitively at the major league level. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, you know, we were encouraged by what we saw last night. On the other hand, it was one inning. Uh, he'll probably pitch another inning or so before the end of the season. Uh, but it's nice to see that he's back and healthy and uh, uh, <coughs> um, pitching as he uh, uh, was capable in the past. Uh, we have two other free agents. Um, Marcus Stroman, who's probably on balance had, uh, you know, the best. Um, uh, record over the course of this season as a starting pitcher, in part because of his effectiveness, but in part because 
uh, he was able to uh, pitch the entire season. And given the fact that he didn't pitch at all last year, um, sort of a remarkable achievement that he was able to stay as healthy as uh, he has been over the course of the year. Um, <clears throat> you know, we very highly value Marcus, and um, you know, we'll be looking forward to the possibility of talking with him. Uh, the last is Javi Baez. <clears throat> um, Baez has been really exceptional for us thus, uh, <clears throat> since uh, he came off the IL <clears throat> on which he was placed shortly after we acquired him. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Javi, uh, as we've all seen, <clears throat> impacts the game in a variety of ways, um, not only offensively with his power, but uh, um, on the bases in the field. Um, probably last night was uh, a testimony to those you know, additional uh, qualities that make him such a good player, uh, that tag at second base early in the game <clears throat> and then scoring from third base on um, that infield hit. So uh, those are a number of the issues that uh, I know you're going to want to talk about. I wanted to kind of, uh, um, <clears throat> if I could, um, hit the high points there so that uh, to the extent you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and we can go deeper into each of those topics and others uh, that uh, you want to talk about. Thank you, Sandy. We have uh, microphones on each side of the room. Please uh, alert our attendants for uh, one. Steve, let's begin with you. Sandy, you know, especially over the last couple of years, there seemed to be a belief with, with a lot of homegrown guys, quite frankly, that there was a, a championship core in place being built. Um, given now that, that that core has not made the playoffs over the last three years, do you still have the belief that this can be a championship core, or do you feel like it needs to be augmented quite a bit heading into next year? Well, I, <clears throat> I think partly it depends on how you define our core of young players. And I think that that core is um, eroding just on the basis of uh, Major League Service, for example. Um, so, you know, Michael Conforto, um, uh, Syndergaard's a free agent. Uh, Nemo will be a free agent in a year or so. Um, so <clears throat> I'm not sure that we've had the core of, of players that would uh, um, allow us to reach that level. Um, you know, the last time we were pretty good in 15 and 16, um, uh, we weren't totally reliable on homegrown players. So I think that, um, you know, the way that I would answer that question is that we need to continue to grow our own players and our player development system uh, needs to continue to uh, produce those young players and we have pretty consistently um, whether we've done it to the level that we need to um, is another question but I think that uh, we've been pretty successful with the draft and some of our international signings but we're gonna have to augment just as we did this year we augmented with uh, uh, additions and I think that um, you know we will continue to look for ways to augment the team so this is this is a team that's going to be driven by player development ultimately but uh, we also have to be transactional uh, I believe and I think that's what we'll be looking for in a new head of uh, baseball operations and I know you said off the top that you know, there are probably numerous reasons why things went the way they did in the second half uh, is there one or two that, that really stand out in your mind as to why this, this type of second half did happen to this group? Well, I, you know, I think there are a couple of things that I would enumerate, and not as excuses, but as factors at least. Um, one was injuries. Everybody has injuries. I know that. Um, we had the highest number of placements on the disabled list, I believe, uh, if we didn't have the highest, it was very high for us. Um, now, you know, the industry as a whole, uh, teams as a whole, I think expected to see more injuries this year because of the abbreviated season last year. Um, in terms of total days missed, um, I think we were in the top two or three of total day, days missed. So, you know, injuries were a factor. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, and we weren't over to, able to overcome them. And uh, that's, you know, the responsibility of the front office and, and myself and so forth to make every effort to try to overcome those. Um, 
certain amount of underperformance, under expectation. Uh, <clears throat> you know, players are not robots. They, uh, um, you know, their seasons uh, ebb and flow uh, from year to year, from month to month. Um, <clears throat> so you can't expect that everybody's going to have a career year or even an average year. Um, but that certainly, you know, was a factor as well. And I think ultimately we, we ran out of depth. Um, we saw that in the starting pitching area. We ended up having to um, pitch uh, a lot of waiver claims, um, you know, from time to time, actually quite often for a period of time. So, um, you know, it's, it's, we didn't hit well. It's part of our underperformance. Um, <clears throat> so I think there are a lot of factors, but um, um, when, you know, when you boil it all down, we didn't, we didn't get there. Tony. Hey, Sandy. Um, oh, off to your right. There he is. If I, if I was uh, reading your tone right off the top, it sounds like you have some optimism that maybe some of the people in that president of baseball ops role that were not available to you last offseason might be available to you now. What gives you that optimism? And, and what is your, your feeling overall of your ability to actually hire one of those people? Well, look, don't read too much optimism into my response. Um, I said there's there's a reason why circumstances could change, um, and that might be again change circumstances for one individual or two individuals. It might be you know change circumstances in terms of you know the the uh, pool of individuals that we decide to contact, which could be somewhat different than uh, um, uh, existed last year. So. Um, you know, I'm optimistic that we this this will we, we will end up in the right place. How exactly we get there and with whom uh, is is up for grabs. Assuming you do hire someone with that title, president of baseball ops, what do you anticipate from that point forward? Your role personally in baseball ops will be. Uh, well, you know, I originally signed on here as uh, president of the team, not as president of baseball operations or general manager. And so what I'm hopeful of is that we can find someone who is um, going to be invested in the team long term and, um, you know, will get in the weeds and provide us with uh, not only the leadership but the expertise that we need uh, on the baseball side. So, um, you know, from my standpoint, um, I'm happy to uh, – turn that over to someone that we find who's uh, um, more than capable. Uh, Joel, we'll go to you on the far left. Uh, Sandy, I wonder if you could go through the dance a little bit of, it feels like your current administration is gonna have to do a lot of work, uh, manager, maybe qualifying offer before you right. hire somebody else. That's a little devilish. Like, what if you decide you're going to keep your manager and the guy who comes in, you want to hire, says, yeah, I have no respect for that guy. I need to have somebody else. Right. Well, look, there, you know, <clears throat> a lot of decisions are driven by the baseball calendar. We know that. I've already talked about qualifying offers, for example. Um, <clears throat> some decisions don't need to be made immediately. Uh, on the other hand, it, it may be in everybody's interest that those decisions are made, in a, you know, in a more timely fashion. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, ideally, you know, we'll have somebody in place uh, who can pick up with the baseball calendar and move us forward. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, there will be some inter, inter, uh, interim decisions that will have to be made. And, um, you know, um, what I would hope is that those decisions are made with a uh, new leadership potentially in mind, not trying to anticipate what they would decide, but uh, um, to make sure that, uh, you know, whether it's in the case of uh, players uh, or uh, other positions, you know, that they have as much flexibility as possible. Can I just follow up on that? Sure. Question, would you hire someone before you knew about people who are still in the playoffs who maybe you don't have access to but you have interest in? You know, that's, that's uh, a timing question that, um, uh, you know, we will address. Um, um, and we'll just have to see who's in and who's out and uh, who's in that pool of individuals that we'd like to talk to. 
So I, I can't give you, uh, you know, a complete answer to that question, but obviously those timing issues exist. Uh, Dave, go to you next. Hey, Sandy, over here on the right. Hey, Just with, with the, the nature of the title with President of Baseball Operations would give him governorship over the, the whole operations. Right. And yet you, you have an acting GM in place on leave right now. Yep. You have some assistant GMs in place. You have an infrastructure that you put in. Right. So is this going to become more of a, a hybrid between people you're going to need or want to stay? for the person coming in, or can you just give that person full autonomy and say, you decide on, this, on who we have here? Right. Um, I would think that might be difficult. Well, <clears throat> so the, the practical answer to that question is that a new person coming in isn't gonna wanna have to deal with all of those types of infrastructure issues immediately. Uh, they're gonna be happy to have a functioning group of capable people who will be able to move the team uh, during those you know, weeks and months that they become more familiar with the operation, more familiar with the, the individual abilities of, of uh, uh, front office employees or uh, you know, others uh, within the organization. So it's not like every um, decision needs to be held up in order to preserve that flexibility. There are a lot of positions they're not gonna wanna deal with they're gonna hope that those things are taken care of and so they will address them over time as opposed to immediately because there will be some other decisions, more you know, uh, critical decisions about players and so forth that uh, may be more immediate. So uh, you know, I'm confident with the group that we have that will be, that we'll be able to support whoever comes in and uh, yeah, that um, um, whoever comes in will then have the opportunity and the time to evaluate as uh, he or she sees fit and um, will make decisions. But I don't think all of those things have to be um, are as time critical as others. There are some things that will just, um, it's good to have resolved, uh, even for somebody that comes in new. And then I know that you've stated in the past that you don't really want to be involved heavily in the baseball operations oversee to some degree as president, but how will that, will that kind of manifest itself going forward? You'll be more of the standoffish and let that person yeah, report I think to you? Yeah, I think it would be a function of what that individual wants. Um, you know, uh, I've got a lot of experience, but to this new individual, my experience may be irrelevant. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's a function of, of uh, Will I be available? Yeah, I'll be certainly present and uh, have interest in what goes on on the baseball side, but uh, my involvement will depend on uh, um, how much this new head of baseball operations uh, uh, wants from me. Uh, Bradford, go ahead on the left. Hi, Sandy, good to see you. Um, so there was a recent report in Fangraphs about another player, actually the Yankees, DJ LeMahieu, being disproportionately affected by the new spec baseball MLB said they introduced this year. Um, where have you or others in your org noticed changes, if any, on how the baseball's impacted performance, whether that's your team or just, you know, around the league? Uh, <clears throat> in either direction, by the way. Yeah. You know, honestly, I haven't heard a lot of discussion about uh, the baseball um, since the early part of the season. Um, you know, the, the flight dynamics and uh, coefficient of restitution and you know, how far the ball goes typically and, and maybe how much shorter it goes. But um, I haven't really heard a lot of discussion about the ball. I think that's basically been um, um, consumed in the, you know, the everyday uh, reporting of, of individual games. But um, I don't think that's been a concern. I don't think anybody with the Mets uh, you know, feels as if the new ball has somehow affected us it, disproportionately to other teams. I just think that uh, um, it's kind of been a non-issue. I mean, the, the, the other issue that did come up, of course, was uh, uh, substances on the ball, which was addressed by Major League Baseball, and we seem to get through that uh, transition pretty well. Not we, but the industry as a whole, uh, us as a team. Um, so I haven't I haven't seen that as, as a you know a controversial issue this year or one that we've been able to really or have tried to um, 
uh, calculate uh, as to its impact. I'm sure that there will be some data that will come out at the end of the season that will uh, address that, and um, um, we'll see what happens uh, at the Major League Baseball level. Thank you. And then another question, uh, just an update, I guess, on uh, your team's vaccination status. But uh, did you did you guys reach the 85 percent threshold? If not, uh, can you share why, I guess, you believe your, you know, your organizational efforts to persuade players about the benefits of, you know, these COVID-19 vaccines weren't effective enough to reach that threshold? And similarly, yeah. of course, you know, if they if you guys are on track to reach that, uh, I'd love to hear why. Yeah. You, uh, so we're, we, we never we never reached 85 percent. Uh, Interestingly, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we didn't get there, uh, we really have had very little COVID impact on our team. And I think that's a testimony not to, you know, the level of vaccination, but the level of attention that, that uh, players and our staff paid um, because we weren't fully vaccinated. Um, you know, as an organization, uh, you're probably aware that we are basically an all vaccination organization to the extent we can be. So every employee in these offices and um, um, uh, our administrative building adjacent space, they all have to be vaccinated. Um, we're extending that to our player development scouting operations uh, wherever they are. Um, we're also um, talking to unions that are represented here, uh, their workforces uh, about being vaccinated. Uh, obviously, we have a vaccination center here on site that's been very successful. We are totally committed to, um, you know, the, the value of vaccinations. Um, I'm disappointed that, not, that we didn't reach that level. Um, I'd be disappointed if we didn't reach 100% because I think it's the right thing to do. Um, but uh, we're doing what we can to make sure that uh, it's, a, it's a safe uh, environment, not only for you know, players, but for coaches and for all of our employees. Right, but and but just, just to follow up on that, I mean, more specifically, I'm glad, of course, I'm glad that, you know, you guys have not had ser serious issues of COVID outbreaks right. or anything. Um, but, you know, in your, from your point of view or perspective or just, you know, speaking to players or, or coaches or whoever, you know, why, why, do you, why do you think that, you know, I guess, mem you know, members of that tier one sort of uh, staffing, um, I guess, didn't, uh, or persuaded, you know. Look, I, th I think I think the answer to that question is uh, um, similar to uh, similar. Uh, if you were asked that question to the general public, there are all kinds of reasons why people state they don't want to get the um, vaccination, ranging from uh, pseudo scientific uh, rationales to others, um, but. You know, I'm not trying to make a political statement here, but I think that, you know, what we feel as an organization is that we have a responsibility to our employees to, to provide a safe workplace, and we have a responsibility to the general public uh, <clears throat> to do what we can to contribute to public health. Justin, back over here on the right. Hey, Sandy, I uh, just wanted to follow up on your point about the candidate pool uh, a couple minutes ago from for baseball operations, if yeah. for ever, whatever reason you guys didn't have access to a number of your top candidates, would you be willing to shift the criteria or go with somebody less experienced? I guess I'm trying to ask how hard and fast set are you on, on just getting somebody in here to fill that? Yeah, no, I, th I you know, <clears throat> I, I can't really answer that question at the moment. That would be speculative based on circumstances that, um, you know, right now we can't at least fully uh, anticipate. Obviously, we had the same situation we faced last year and ultimately did have to make some accommodation. Um, but for me to get into how we might accommodate this year, uh, I think is a little premature. So why don't you ask me that question again in three or four weeks, if necessary. Sounds good. And how realistic is it, uh, do you think it is to, ex uh, to re-sign bias? Is it possible? Yes. Is it realistic? Maybe. I mean, it's hard for me to put, you know, uh, odds on it. Um, 
does Javi want to be here? Did he enjoy his stay? Uh, um, you know, what can be expected from him over the next several years? A lot of things that go into any free agent uh, decision. Um, but to say, no, there's absolutely no way that Javi Baez can be part of the Mets next year, no, I wouldn't be prepared to say that at this point. Uh, Tim, let's go to you. Tim Britton there in the middle. Hey, Sandy. Um, you know, given what happened with, with Jared Porter last year and, and even with Mickey going back a, a few years with both of them on the ineligible list, what, what changes might you make to the hiring process this time around to try to avoid that type of, of thing happening? Well, we, <coughs> you know, after the Jared Porter uh, situation arose, I, I think I made it clear that, um, you know, we would do what we could to uh, expand the, um, the process of both identifying candidates, interviewing candidates, doing backgrounds on candidates, um, and that has been the case. Um, uh, on the other hand, there's, there's never a perfect uh, background investigation. There's never, you know, the ability to perfectly predict uh, um, what circumstances might arise. So, you know, I think we're being more fulsome in our uh, uh, review process um, and broader in, you know, the types of people that we talk to, uh, men and women, um, more senior, less senior. Um, so I think what we're, we're doing is, you know, to, uh, um, to the extent that we can, uh, to make sure the process is more um, uh, systematic, deeper, broader, and um, you know includes feedback from as many different sources as we can possibly get. And then as you look to build out your front office this winter, where, where does Zach Scott kind of fit into things at this point? Yeah. So Zach, uh, as you know, is on administrative leave. Um, and there's been very little contact with Zach uh, since the incident took place. Um, my understanding is that his legal situation will be resolved sometime in early October. Uh, and at that time, um, you know, we will review his situation, his status, um, try to get a better understanding of what happened that evening because we've tried to stay out of the legal process so that we don't interfere with that. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll make a decision as to uh, uh, how to resolve that situation. Wayne, uh, you're next there in the back. Sandy, how do you expect the CBA negotiations to impact the team's off-season plans or just kind of the off-season flow in general? Well, it's hard to say that, you know, the current CBA expires on December 2nd. So all of the activity uh, up to December 2nd will be under the existing CBA and there won't be any, uh, you know, exceptions uh, for that. So uh, making qualifying offers, uh, um, contracts have to be tendered by December 2nd. Um, you know, there will be a, a lot of ongoing activity that will take place up through December 2nd under the current CBA. The fact though, as you point out, that uh, there's a new one to be negotiated does create uh, a number of different um, uh, questions. Uh, one of them is, um, for example, um, you know, will there be a DH in the National League? That's, you know, that's an issue that if it's not resolved till the beginning of spring training, puts a little bit of a crimp in what, um, you know, uh, National League clubs are able to do. That's just one example. Um, <clears throat> Who knows where the collect the uh, competitive balance tax threshold will be? You know, there are a variety of different uh, impacts from roster composition to uh, financial commitments um, that do you know do create a few um, uh, uncertainties. But I will I will tell you that um, you know as an organization, we are not planning short term, we're planning long term. So there's no question that the uncertainty surrounding that, uh, that agreement will have an impact. Uh, but a lot of what we're doing, both in terms of building the player development side, 
building our analytics department, building our front office generally, has a longer term view. Uh, specific player issues may be impacted, uh, certainly. I mean, <clears throat> depending on what happens um, uh, on December 2nd, there could be a freeze on all player transactions for who knows how long. So it's hard to predict exactly what impact it will have, but it's definitely, uh, you know, a looming issue. Hey, Sandy, just how do you balance what most players and even Luis Rojas have said about this team, which is that they're a special group, they love their preparation, their approach, um, maybe not their performance, but they you know, also love their clubhouse culture versus what needs to be done this offseason and versus the results that, that we've seen uh, up to this point? Well, you know, I'm big on process, but ultimately results matter. And... Uh, you know, if you don't have good results over a period of time, then uh, the process may not survive. So, uh, you know, I'm appreciative of all of those positives that uh, have been mentioned over the course of the year. Um, you know, Louis' relationship with the players, uh, et cetera. Um, but ultimately, uh, we have to be governed to some extent, not just by the process and by what goes into the results, but the results themselves. And um, <clears throat> so as we, you know, approach the end of the season, um, we have to be realistic about the result, what the results have been. And then how would someone like Theo Epstein fit into this front office? And in, is he someone on your short list for president of baseball operations? Yeah, I, <coughs> I, I, I uh, told myself that I wouldn't talk about individuals uh, during the course of this uh, gathering. So um, it's really not appropriate at this point to talk about individuals um, and uh, so I'm going to refrain from doing that uh, nice try right behind there Hannah let's go to you next hey Sandy you yeah. actually alluded to this in one of your earlier answers but between now and December 2nd are you going to be operating as if there will be a work stoppage uh, we're not going to be operating as if there will be a work stoppage but we are going to be, we will be operating with that possibility in mind. Um, so, and I think every club will be. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the implications are not limited to the players and the schedule and games. It's also something that impacts um, our uh, ticket holders, obviously, but also, um, you know, our partners. Uh, our employees um, uh, in a variety of different, uh, you know, jobs and responsibilities. So it's it's a it's a big, um, uh, large sort of looming issue that we have to deal with. We have a little committee that's you know thinking about these issues. It's still a little early to t to think uh, uh, concretely because we don't really know what's going to happen over the next couple of months. Well, I guess sort of less so affecting the actual season and more in the potential for a freeze on any transactions like will you I don't know whether anyone in baseball ops is sort of thinking about it. does it make oh, sense yeah. to front load the the your offseason moves and how does that fit specifically with what the Mets need to do to build out that baseball yeah operations? I think that uh, it's a good question uh, do you run out and try to fill all your needs before December 2nd or do you wait and see what's available uh, once things are resolved I think um, if, if you go back to um, prior years, I think what, um, what I would say in answer to that question is that traditionally what I personally like to do is do a little bit early, a little bit in the middle, and hold your power for what may be available at the end. And so uh, that kind of approach gets disrupted by uh, you know, would would get disrupted by a work stoppage. But there's still the beginning and the end. <laughs> and uh, so I think what you have to do is really balance uh, um, filling some needs perhaps that you feel are more critical and uh, kind of a baseline for what you want to do and then, you know, leave yourself open for uh, possibilities as they emerge. Be opportunistic. Rich, uh, you're up next. Sandy, I'll come over here. Yep. Um, two quick questions on your pitching staff. One is you obviously have DeGrom, 
and two other pitchers, Carrasco, um, under contract. But you have some decisions to make with Syndergaard and Stroman. Is that something you think is a a, a big A1 goal in the offseason to keep those five intact? And secondly, one of the guys you didn't mention was Aaron Loop. Is he someone that you would want back on the team as well? Yeah. So with respect to the starting pitching, I think the key is that we want to have as deep a roster of starting pitching as we can possibly have uh, going into spring training. Does that mean that we retain all of the starting pitchers that we currently have? As you point out, we have you know DeGrom, uh, Carrasco, and Walker going into next season. That's three. Um, you know, is there a real desire to hold on to uh, exist, existing Mets players? I think probably there's a, you know, there's a, you know, a, um, some bias in that regard, a yes. On the other hand, I, I think our overall goal is to be as good and as deep as we possibly can, and it depends on, you know, where we're able to find those players, whether it's through trade or free agency or retaining some of our own players. You know, we'll, we, we definitely have to maintain um, – uh, and or create as much depth as we possibly can. Uh, Devin, go ahead, right in the middle. Uh, yeah, when it comes to personnel um, and making decisions about that, that goes for players as well. Um, and there's a there's an alternate universe where Trevor Bauer could have been in a Mets uniform this season. So, um, what does the team, Steve Cohen, perhaps take away from that experience when it goes to making personnel decisions on players going forward next year? What does he take away from this year's experience? Well, with that experience as well, go, I mean, he, there were character questions about him going into the free agency pursuit of him, and even among some people on the team, as I understand it, in the clubhouse. So, who, I guess who are we I'm, talking about? Trevor Bauer. Oh. Uh, there were lot, lots of questions about Trevor Bauer that we tried to answer, um, and uh, that included you know, some of the broader, deeper <laughs> conversations than we'd had before with respect to executives. Um, and uh, um, so I think that the process we went through uh, was, um, was a good one. Um, we had lots of feedback, including from our own employees, um, uh, male and female. So, um, you know, that's an unfortunate situation um, and uh, the good news is it didn't happen on our watch. Um, and just a quick different subject. Jeff McNeil and Dom Smith, I think, maybe are two of the people that fall into that underperformance category. And what I'm wondering is, do you see those two players as bad luck, numbers, just balls not dropping in, um, and that they'll recover? Or is this a case where maybe they have lower ceilings than you might have thought of going into this season? Yeah, look, that's that's a good question. Uh, let me let me broaden it a little bit beyond those two players. I think that you know, anytime you finish a season, what you really have to do is reevaluate each player and try to decide who they really are. So that would be true in a season where a, a player underperforms. It might be a season in which a player overperforms. You really have to do an evaluation of what you know predictively will happen in the future. So uh, <clears throat> um, they've both had excellent years in the past. Um, and as I said before, players are not robotic. This is not uh, an automatic. Um, players' performances uh, move up and move down. I mean, we take a look at our season this year and see some of the high, high months in which uh, our players performed, some of the um, you know, months in which they weren't nearly as good. Um, so that happens. What we have to decide is, uh, um, again, predictably, what that means for the future. Uh, but certainly, you know, Dom has been excellent for us in the past, um, and uh, so is McNeil. Um, I do think one of the things that needs to change offensively on our club is we, we, need, we do need to be more disciplined at the plate. And uh, that's a characteristic that every successful team has. Uh, it's not unique to the Mets. Um, and so I think that's something that uh, we need to be mindful of as we go forward. And, uh, you know, both of those players are capable of uh, um, that kind of 
play discipline. Tony, back to you. Just two more quick ones for me, Sandy. Um, one, Noah last night was pre <laughs> sounded pretty confident that he would be back next season. It, it made me wonder if you guys are actively negotiating something now beyond the idea of a qualifying offer, and if not, is that something that is that a road that you can see yourself going down, or is it kind of qualifying offer or bust for him? No, again, I I, I prefer not to answer that question. It's not like I want to reveal my cards or anything, but, uh, you know, again, he, he pitched last night for the first time in two years. And so, um, you know, we take that into account. He'll pitch one more time. Not that those two innings are going to tell us anything definitive, but um, I think for him, those innings were important. Um, so, you know, what I do appreciate is players – who have a real passion for New York. Um, and uh, that's not just because they can be more successful in New York. Um, I think guys like uh, Alonzo, um, for example, have really demonstrated their commitment to the city and to its people. And, um, you know, those are positive things to take into account. So I'm happy Noah wants to be in New York, and um, that's a big step in that direction. And just to clarify something you said on Zach Scott earlier, um, is that a situation where obviously, you know, you said you're not going to do anything until this next step of litigation is complete. Is that a decision that could ultimately fall under the purview of your your president of baseball operations, or is that something you will make before that happens? Well, <clears throat> I think that, um, as I said, anybody's tenure with the Mets will be subject to um, uh, the decision of a new head of baseball operations. Uh, that doesn't mean, though, there won't be an interim decision between the time that, you know, one is appropriate, if not necessary, and somewhat longer term when that head of baseball comes in. So I could see a, situa I could see a situation where, you know, the interim decision is made. And if there's, you know, ultimately a decision to be made by the, the head of baseball operations later, he or she will be able to do that. Joel, look, come back to you over there on the left. Uh, Sandy, you said you wouldn't name names, but have you begun the process of reaching out to people for that j job, the president of baseball operations? No. Uh, and you, I, I believe you uh, retained, was it Corn Ferry last year to help you with this? Will you do something similar this year? Uh, we will do something similar this year, yes. And uh, just a bigger, broader question is, you served under the last ownership and you served under this one. Mm -hmm. And I think you were saying last, uh, that last year one of the reasons you didn't have access to people was they were on the contract, you couldn't get to them. It seemed also that there were people unsure about this owner and this franchise if they wanted to come work here. Having worked for both now, what do you have to sell? And I wonder if you think it's better than it was. Well, I don't want to get into comparisons. Um, you know, I was just on the phone this morning uh, on a call with both Steve Cohen and Fred Wilpon. So uh, I'm not going to get into comparisons. Um, I will say this, that um, I think the limitations that we faced last year uh, with, with respect to a president of baseball operations had more to do with uh, contractual limitations than with undesirability. I don't think that was an issue. Now, look, there are plenty of people in the game who are, you know, in very comfortable and successful positions. And the idea of moving anywhere, you know, with a family, uh, with, uh, you know, a variety of other personal considerations, with the comfort level that exists, uh, um, you know, at, a, at an existing job, uh, I get that. I don't think that has much to do with Steve Cohen. I don't think it has much to do with uh, um, the New York Mets. Um, some people love the idea of moving to New York. Some people, you know, would prefer to live in, you know, Kansas City or um, San Diego. So um, I don't think it. I, I don't think there's any reason why Steve, Steve Cohen and the Mets are really any less desirable today than they were a year ago 
and will be. I'm, I'm very super um, uh, positive about the Mets long term. I mean, look, you know, Steve's got a passion. Um, uh, he's a new owner, but he learns quickly. And um, I think that a lot of people in the game see the potential for the Mets, whether it was realized this year in year one or not. Um, it's the longer term view that I think it would, would, uh, will make this uh, an attractive place to be. I wonder just as hard, can you drill down on that more? What is it? If you were selling someone who you really wanted to take this job, what do you sell? I'm selling Steve Cohen. I'm selling New York. I'm selling the uh, opportunity to realize on a, uh, the potential of a, and I think I used this term a year ago, a storied but yet not yet iconic franchise. Uh, I think there's a tremendous amount to offer uh, someone coming uh, to the Mets. Is it a, you know, a, a, a set piece? Is it something that you know doesn't require uh, a certain amount of work? You know, that's where the real enjoyment comes in is creating something. We have time for one last quick one. Steve, go ahead and finish up with you. Sandy, back over to your right. Um, right. So you've talked a lot about process today and and how you're a big process guy. You've also talked about the underperformance and and the human element that comes along with a lot of these players. As you look at specifically the hitting process that was implemented this year, obviously there was a coaching change, but analytics beefed up and, and certainly new ways of delivering information to the hitters. Are you comfortable with where that process went or as you look to evaluate things, is the process itself something you will evaluate? Do you think that that in any way potentially contributed to the, the down years across the board that we saw? It's, it's a good question. And I think what we have to do is evaluate um, what information was available to us, what was distilled down and, and given to the players and in what form, and whether that became uh, you know, a uh, benefit to the players or an impediment to the players. Um, so that's, that to me is an open question that we have to, interestingly, we really had kind of two different approaches uh, to the hitting situation, um, you know, um, uh, both of which can be successful. You know, one was a little more intuitive and instinctual and experience-based, and another was um, a little more data-driven. Um, so I think that, uh, that's definitely something we have to look at to see whether the process contributed to the problem or, um, you know, the, the, the problems um, lurk elsewhere. How do you look at something like that? How do you, I mean, is that something that through conversations with players or how do you, how do you put, you know, an, an Yeah, I think we have to get, I think we have to, you know, typically at the end of the season, there will be exit interviews and we'll talk to players and to coaches and to um, our support staff to see what their impressions were and how that information was uh, utilized um, well or otherwise. But that's definitely something that we, we just have to look into and get feedback from those who were directly involved. Sandy, thank you very much. Thank you for everybody for uh, joining us. We do have to make our way down to the field with Sandy. He's doing a presentation there. Thanks, so. everybody, for thank uh, you. coming.